So hello everyone, welcome to this webinar of Land is Forever, the fourth and final webinar. Is there a future for private land conservation tools in Europe? This webinar was prepared by the European Landowners Organization and the Nature Conservancy. Conservancy sorry. This online event is part of the Life Plus project Land is Forever, which aims the expansion and introduction of voluntary conservation tools in Europe from which private landowners can benefit for their conservation efforts. The overall purpose is to investigate in existing and innovative tools and structures and expand their use in the European Union. Today, this webinar will focus on private land conservation tools and their use. We are going to discover those tools, their specificities and use around the world. How are they instrumented in the United States what's the key to success, and how to increase their use, particularly in Europe then. And to have an even more immersive approach, a roundtable discussion of 20 minutes will gather diverse stakeholders, uh, amongst which a private landowner, someone from a uh, conservation NGO, a European Commission representative, and finally also a researcher from the sector. You will be able to ask your questions during those presentations and exchange, and we will answer them as much as possible at the end of every session. During a 15 minutes Q&A, feel free to use the Q&A button, which you can see under here uh, beneath in the Zoom webinar interface. Today we have the chance to host Philip Tabas and Jürgen Tack. Philip Tabas is a special advisor of the Nature Conservancy. Philip will give, um, will give you and me an overview of the tools they use in the United States. After Phil, Jürgen Tack, the scientific director of the European Landowners Organization, ELO, will give you an overview of the tools in Europe. Philip, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Valerie. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the experience of the uh, pri of private lands conservation in the United States. Uh, private lands conservation in the United States has been an increasingly popular tool. And largely that's because it's seen as a, uh, in, um, an alternative to more controversial uh, environmental regulations and allows uh, uh, people to come together to protect places that they are fond of and that are important for conservation. Um, I think what accounts for the success can be characterized into four uh, themes. Uh, next slide, please. The first theme has to do with the increasing availability of conservation science for private lands conservation. Uh, over the years, uh, we, have we have developed uh, more uh, information and made it available, more readily available to private landowners as to how they can use their land in ways that are compatible with conservation and also allow uh, uh, pr uh, productive economic uses. Uh, in 1974, for example, uh, the, there was an effort to create state natural heritage programs, which are databases of important natural features uh, in every state. And that information was used to guide decision-making by uh, state programs and private landowners. And more recently, the organization NatureServe has been created to help facilitate the dissemination of this conservation science and conservation land management to private landowners. Next slide, please. Uh, another theme has to do with the increasing use of conservation easements and other kinds of cooperative agreements. A conservation easement is an agreement between a landowner and, and the holder of, a con of, an of the easement, which is generally a land trust that allows the landowner to use the land for economic uses, but limits it to those uses that are compatible with conservation and the landowner retains the right of ownership and control of the land. And uh, land trusts have grown, uh, increase, the numbers of land trusts have grown increasing. Uh, and they, these are organizations that are private charitable conservation groups, uh, helping landowners uh, facilitate the protection of their land through conservation easements and other kinds of stewardship agreements. Next slide, please. Just to show you the increasing popularity of land trust, in 1980, when uh, the tax incentive for conservation easements was enacted by the US uh, government and the Congress, 
there are about 200 land trusts operating in the United States. But since that time, uh, there has been a, an explosion, I would say, of an increase in land trusts to about 1,400 land trusts nationwide, four, 450 of which are accredited by the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. And they've protected about 16.2 uh, million acres by conservation easement easements um, and about 20 million acres through other acquisition methods. Uh, just to get, paint a picture of uh, the total uh, con uh, lands that have been protected by conservation easements, are the uh, National Conservation Easement Database reports that about 32 million acres of land have been protected and the additional acres between the 16 million protected by land trust is, is, accounts, is accounted for by the holding of easements by government agencies and uh, at the state, local, and federal level. Next slide, please. One of the reasons why, an, another reason why uh, conservation, private land conservation has been in, uh, increasing in the US has been the growing importance of financial and tax incentives for private landowners. In the US, we have an, a range of in, tax incentives including incentives to, for landowners to make gifts of land or easements, uh, incentives to help uh, encourage them to sell land at less than fair market value for conservation. We've got incentives that defray the cost of restoration activities, uh, incentives to reduce the cost of ownership by uh, uh, making property taxes and other expenses of ownership tax deductible. And we've got uh, other kinds of uh, uh, tax incentives to subsidize the transaction expenses of conservation uh, uh, organizations. Just to show you how important this is, uh, the value of conservation easement donations in as of 2014 was about $3.2 billion in the US. By comparison, the total federal budget for appropriated, that was appropriated for dollars for acquisition was only about $300 billion in the same year. Next slide, please. The final uh, theme and incentive or reason why private lands conservation has increased is because of the strong role of private philanthropy in the US and private and the extent of private property. Um, the, uh, in, in the US, the US has been ranked first in total charitable, charitable giving for many years. And uh, the US has, a, has had a tax incentive for tax deductions for gifts uh, for over a hundred years in our tax code. And uh, in the United States, the private land uh, constitutes about uh, over two thirds of the ownership of, of the extent of our, our, our acreage. So those are some of the highlights of why private lands conservation has been so popular in the US. Back to you, Valerie. Thank you, Phil, for your presentation, uh, which was very enlightening. We will now continue uh, with Jürgen Tack, who will give us an overview of uh, Europe. Jürgen, the floor is yours, please. Thank you much, Valerie. Um, I will talk first of all about the tools and instruments uh, we are using within uh, the European Union and then especially within the EU member states. And first thing I have, I have to say, we noticed uh, quite soon that we have a major difference uh, between the different EU member states making use of sometimes very different tools and instruments, sometimes uh, tools and instruments which are available in one, but not available in the other. So it's a real mix. You also see that quite often there are different instruments for NGOs on one side and uh, for individual private landowners on the other side. There are two. That is something we see in much, uh, most of the EU member states. And then a, a third aspect, uh, which is important, is that we see that we see different structures in function of nature conservation implemented by the different EU member states. And with structures, we are referring to the ways private landowners are um, joining each other uh, with the idea, uh, let's do something together for private land conservation. Next slide, please. Um, here uh, you get an overview uh, of the different tools and instruments that within the, the Land is Forever project we have identified within the different uh, EU member states. Now the first one, the conservation easement uh, is, a, is a very typical tool from, from the states, but we see that within a, a couple of EU member states, we see that the conservation easement is also used and we see that there are sometimes uh, slight differences. Now in general, it is a voluntary but legally binding agreement between a landowner and an organization. 
which can be an NGO or a, or a government agency, where the landowner, sometimes temporary, sometimes longer, relinquishes certain rights over the land to protect the natural landscape while maintaining the ownership and the use of the land in ways that do not conflict with the terms of uh, the easement. Uh, in this type of tool, the landowner retains the right to use the land, to produce on the land, to sell it, and even to pass it on their hairs. The second one is land uh, stewardship. And here the landowner keeps the management of the land, but commits at the same time to a set of conservation oriented actions with a recognized NGO or governmental agency. In that case, both parties agree and commit on, on an equal level to the terms and conditions of the agreement. A third uh, uh, instrument is the private reserve designation. Now, private reserves are defined as land under private ownership that has been set aside for the protection of nature and its components through a legal and other, effect and, and other effective means for public or for personal benefits. And that can be, for instance, natural water filter, game management. And here the landowner commits in a voluntary way the land as a private reserve and agrees at the same time on a long-term commi commitment to manage the, uh, the land in function of biodiversity. Another tool is a conservation contract where the landowners enters a voluntary contract quite often for a limited uh, period of time. And it's doing that with an organization or a governmental agency to ensure that the property is used or managed for conservation uh, purposes. Now, this contract has a clear end and clearly state that there are no further consequences after the contract period, which for many of the private landowners is an important aspect. Now we have a, the safe harbor agreement. Um, this is um, a way where landowners receive a formal no penalty assurance from the government in exchange for fulfilling the specific conditions of a biodiversity value agreement that contributes to the recovery of endangered species. Another tool are strategic partnerships between companies and private landowners where conservation actions by private landowners uh, are compensating for biodiversity losses elsewhere. Also uh, see land exchange for conservation where the landowner agrees to an exchange of land that is most of the time ecologically val uh, valuable uh, for one that is less ecologically valuable but may retain other especially economic uh, values. And then we see that there are a lot of incentives and compensation mechanisms from private landowners going from direct payments uh, from, from the government, direct payments from NGOs through grants and funds, tax benefits and label or certification for market uh, access. Next slide, please. Now the core issues that we have noticed uh, between uh, the period uh, we are running the Land is Forever project is that well, we have to say that the set of tools offered uh, has to respect the variety of private landowners. This is a very important uh, issue as we see that the engagement of private landowners can be at a very different level. So we need a tool for each of the levels available. Now, the application and monitoring requirements are equal and feasible for individual owners and NGO. There too, that equality is a very important issue for private landowners. Of course, the tools should respect uh, the economic value of the land. That, that is a very elementary aspect uh, for private landowners as they see their land uh, as a value, as well ecologically, but also economically. And then uh, tools and their compensation mechanisms are organized in a framework which a landowner can trust on the long term. It's very important if you make an agreement today that you can have the same terms within five years, within 10 years, or whatever the, the project uh, or the contract period is. Also very important for them is a two-way knowledge exchange in agreeing on a contract uh, that is uh, also very critical uh, when, when cooperating with others. And the tools should offer flexibility in case of threats undermining the values of the land. For instance, uh, when you have climate extremities or diseases or aspects that are not always under the control of the landowner. 
And then a, a, a last core issue is the support in insurance and liability of the private owner when opening uh, the land uh, for public required. That is still quite often uh, problematic uh, for many private land owners, so we should take that into account. I think this gives a, an overview uh, from uh, the European perspective. Thank you, Jürgen, for this clear presentation and overview. We will now continue with the round table and ask our various stakeholders to give their points of view on private conservation tools. Um, for this round table, our four panelists are Tilman Disselhoff, who is uh, representing the conservation organizations. Next one is Anne-Sophie Gamborg, who is representing individual private land owners and land managers. As a third representer, we have Joseph van der Stegen, who is representing the DG environment, and finally Sue Stolten, representing researchers. Tilman Disseldorf, allow me to give you some more information on our speakers on this round table. Tilman Disseldorf is the coordinator of the European Land Conservation Network, which is an initiative of the conservation organizations and land user groups to advance private land conservation in Europe. Tillman works as a project coordinator for the Nature and Biodiversity Conservation Union, NABU, one of the oldest and largest environmental associations in Germany. Next speaker, Anne-Sophie Gamborg, is owner and manager of Müllerop Estate in Denmark. They are famous for growing hemp, but um, they, are, they are in fact a true multifunctional estate. They have farms, forestry, holiday stays, and they organize events and hunting. Our third speaker, Joseph van der Stegen, has a background of forest engineer. He worked in the private forest sector in France, and later on, he was in charge of the management of protected areas and forests on public land in Belgium. He now works in the European Commission on the DG Environment, where he's in charge of bird conservation issues and the development of private land conservation in Europe. Sue Stolten, finally, established equilibrium research with Nigel Dudley in 1990, focusing over the next 30 years on a wide range of issues to promote successful area-based conservation. Sue is part of the IUCN WCPA, Privately Protected Areas and Nature Stewardship Specialist Group. So I will now leave the floor to Tillman as our for first speaker. Tillman, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Valerie. Um, and thanks to the organizers of this event for putting together this very interesting panel and uh, a warm welcome to our audience. I would like to take the uh, next two minutes to shortly introduce the European Land Conservation Network to you. Uh, as you can see on my first slide, um, the ELCN is an, an initiative of a group of organizations, mostly representing the conservation and geo community in Europe. But there are also some public entities amongst us and also some land use interest groups. The network started um, in 2017 in the framework of a, uh, an EU funded life project, which is still ongoing. Um, and recently, um, the ELCN was integrated into Eurosite. So we now have a permanent uh, secretariat for the ESCN going forward. Next slide, please. You may ask yourself, why start this network? Well, the first reason is we need to get better at conserving nature on private land if we want to reach EU biodiversity policy goals. Um, but, and this uh, is something that I would like to stress very much, uh, it's not the only reason for engaging in this network. Um, on the right side of this slide is an image that I snatched uh, actually from a presentation by Alex Datema of Buro Natur, uh, a Dutch organization. Um, it shows um, population trends for five species in the Dutch countryside. And it kind of summarizes very well the situation that we are in. Four of these species are farmland birds, and the fifth species is actually humans, and uh, particularly humans working in agriculture. So 
for me, that was a very striking image. And it shows that uh, not only natural communities are under threat in the countryside, but so are social communities. And they are actually just two sides of the same coin. Now the ILC, uh, ELCN sorry, intends to tackle this double challenge by connecting and supporting initiatives using private land conservation tools. And Phil and Jürgen have already mentioned some of these interesting tools. I just would like to point out uh, some important characteristics that they have in common. They're all voluntary, they're collaborative, they're pragmatic on the ground, and they're fair. Um, so for me, this is a way of looking at uh, conservation that includes all stakeholders and gives them a fair um, share of the debate and um, the possibility to take their own decisions. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is my last slide. As one of the things we did as part of our project um, was to carry out a census of private land conservation initiatives in Europe. And as you can see, we found quite a lot of them actually. Uh, so what I hope is that the ELCN will be of service to as many of them as possible and everyone else basically working on collaborative approaches to solving those crises facing land and private property today. Um, the last point I would like to make is that we consider ourselves as part of a family of similar networks around the world with the International Land Conservation Network operating on a global level. And um, I would like to recommend to you to visit the ILCN's website and the ELCN's website for further information. I'm looking forward to the discussion and to your questions. Thanks a lot and back to you, Valerie. Thank you, Tilman, for this interesting uh, overview. Now let's continue with Anne-Sophie. Anne-Sophie, will you please tell us more about your estate's mother up? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for having me at this webinar. It's, um, it's very interesting and it's very important um, that we have these discussions uh, across the, all the people who are interested. Well, um, the, the, the first question is uh, why private landowners um, is important in the conservation um, policy. I mean, altogether to, to make sure we have the conservation we are, and they achieve the goals. Well, private landowners have um, in Denmark at least 60% of the farmland and 80% of the forest. Uh, and, and actually they, they have uh, most of the, of the, uh, the interesting um, uh, nature that needs to be conserved. Uh, they are also the ones who, who have the information. You can take the next slide. They also have the information and the knowledge um, that, that about their land. The thing is, it's it's very very different. The land uh, uh, within few kilometers it changes dramatically, and and some species um, are, are very uh, are very often in one area and few kilometers away they are not because it's a totally different landscape or forest or whatever. So the people who know um, the land must be involved. That's that's absolutely necessary. Um, and that uh, comes also to another side of the coin. That is, uh, a lot of the, the conservancy has been made by private people. And they've had uh, a certain thing they've been interested in. But actually, maybe they don't know that they have other very important things on their land. So uh, in Denmark, we are discussing that somehow we need to come across to the individual owners on a one-to-one -one basis and give them the knowledge about what they're doing because they're already protecting a lot, but maybe they don't know everything. That even comes down to the Nature 2000. People don't know why they're protecting it. They don't always, some do of course. So then it's very important the incentives are, uh, are sufficient and that it's not only covering the costs, but actually makes it a business for some people. And then the last one is removal of barriers. Um, if people are afraid of their, their um, um, uh, ownership rights and so on, and, and they cannot trust the government and they don't get the, the, the compensations that they were promised to get, then, then um, they, they will, won't be part of it. And then I don't think we necessarily need to share that now, but in Denmark, we have some positive results uh, involving people. We have the biotope plants where we, for uh, hunting, we have people that, that can, uh, 
if you do a, a biotope plan and a wild game management plan, then you are allowed to release birds. So you do and you get something. And that's, that's a very good thing. We work very well with the NGOs. And when we do, we come through very well. So, and then the diversity is important that each owner has a different preference and that should come through as well. And then we have separate laws for forest and farmland. And that's also important. And the less positive, I think we also discussed before, um, we don't evaluate very, very well. And there aren't many credits made for what's already been done. It's always what we need to do more. And that makes it difficult to be the owner. Um, yes, so, and then I think the private ownership has a long term, whereas political people are there for very short time, policymakers are there for a short time. So actually, they, they are often under the influence of fashion and trends. Um, and, and they don't necessarily um, understand that it's a very long game. Um, so that was just from me, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Anne-Sophie, for your witness as a landowner. So we now heard uh, the Nature Conservancy and a landowner. It's up to you next, Joseph, to enlighten us uh, about how the European Union sees the future of private land conservation. Joseph, the floor is yours. Yes, sorry. My, so, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting the commission. Uh, so, next slide, please. I would just uh, like to start by uh, recalling the global context, political context at EU level. As most of you will know, we have the EU Green Deal, which provides a, a, a good momentum for private land preservation. It's a very uh, important uh, political um, initiative, of course. It aims to tackle the, our main environmental challenges, climate, uh, biodiversity loss, but it's also a growth strategy. And it aims to, um, to make the EU more sustainable. One of the initiatives that, will be, that has been taken under the EU Green Deal is the EU, new EU biodiversity strategy. And here, here on the slide, you have uh, some of the initiatives, some of the objectives of the new biodiversity strategy. It's rather ambitious, but there is major role to play for private landowners. For instance, as regards the restoration of degraded, uh, degraded ecosystems or for protected areas or for restoring rivers. So a lot to do everywhere also for private landowners. So next slide, please. And within the context of the biodiversity strategy, the Natural 2000 network, which has been designated under the Birds and Habitats Directive, will remain at the core of what we need to do. It's an obligation for member states. It provides obligations for the landowners too. And because it concerns 80% of the EU, so it's a lot, many landowners are concerned. And some have been compensated, are compensated, but we know that there has been some resistance among landowners for good or bad reasons, but there has been some resistance sometimes. Still, the Net 2000 network has delivered major conservation successes, but we know that we have not reached the goal and we need to do more. And that's why we have the biodiversity strategy and we want to further implement Net 2000. What have been the tool, the main, the most common used tool to implement um, the nature conservation policy of the uh, of the EU? Um, as regards proactive management, it has mostly been grants, grants given to NGOs, but also grants given to, to private landowners, uh, for instance, via the Common Agricultural Policy. And um, but there has been, I must say rather limited use of the tools which have been explained by our previous speaker. So we know, still we know that there are many existing uh, good voluntary initiatives, but they are sometimes scattered, unknown, not enough recognized. So we have enhanced ambitions, more efforts need to be done. We need to have everybody on board, also the landowners. And that's why the commission has funded uh, those life projects that aim to look at how to better involve private landowners in nature conservation. And we are very happy because in the upcoming project, 
the NGOs, the private landowners and the authorities will work together uh, to reflect on how to improve the conservation aspects on private land. And they, in the context of those projects, the, the partners will test, expand, monitor, support, share tools to improve private land conservation in the EU. So it's very exciting and I'm happy that we can discuss that today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. I hear there's still a lot of work to do to continue to the implementation and we must work together. Thank you for your positive notes. We will now continue to our last and final uh, speaker uh, to give their point of view. Uh, Sue Stolten, we would like to hear your reflections on the subject as a researcher. Thank you, Sue, the floor is yours. Thank you and um, hello to everybody. Um, well, I'm partly here representing IUCN especially specialist group on privately protected areas and nature stewardship. Um, I suspect most of you know about the World Commission on Protected Areas, I hope so. Um, basically, it means that you spend a lot of your time volunteering for the Commission and you have no money whatsoever for it. Um, so it's not a funded uh, group of people, but it's a group of specialists, both researchers and landowners, um, NGOs who are passionate about private conservation. Um, despite having you know, limited funding, we do quite a lot of networking around the world. Uh, we've developed um, a a report a few years ago on the futures of privately protected areas and some guidelines on managing privately protected areas which I suspect some of you on this call may well have been involved in. And the next slide. Um, I thought as I was the last speaker I'd be a little bit provocative. Um, we've already talked about the kind of big, the bigger picture than the Natura 2000 network, um, the, the really ambitious and very welcome um, strategy for 2030 for 30% protection and other things. So I think the question is not um, whether there's a future for private land conservation tools, but how do we make those cool, cool tools most effective? Because one of the lessons that we also know from Nature 2000, the Nature 2000 network, is that there's still um, a really downward trend in a lot of biodiversity as Tillman showed in his slide. So in terms of tools and financial incentives, well, I also think that maybe we need to tackle perverse incentives as much as we need new incentives. Um, we need to make sure that what private land conservation we have is effective. So maybe our focus needs to be um, as much on uh, tools as on education, as on supporting owners, identifying areas of biodiversity, sharing practical management um, responses and monitoring and most importantly, reporting successes across the network. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you, Sue, and thank you to all the others for giving your feedback. Uh, we will now launch the round table discussions with all of you. Um, so we have four questions for you. And the first question is, why is private land conservation important? Um, so Joseph, as a European Commission representative, can you tell us what is your opinion on that? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Valérie. I would see two aspects uh, within that question. First of all, why we need the contribution of landowners and then why do we need specific tools for that? On the first aspect, the contribution of landowners I mean, as we have just said, there are enhanced ambitions, so we need to have everybody on board, NGOs, authorities, public and the private landowners, and more than before, because I mean, we can do a lot more in this field. And so, as said, landowners own a large proportion of the land in the EU, and so the people who use the land have a major uh, responsibility. And then in relation to that also, and with the Green Deal, I mean, we make much more the link now between nature and con economy and social aspects. And this will, of course, be, I mean, useful for landowners because they know that, that they need to get money from the land. So there are business opportunities though there, while the opportunities that can be good for biodiversity too. And then another reason why we need it is that, as said, I mean, the, the, the nature 
in outside protected areas in the wider countryside. And there, obviously, the landowners are key players. Now, I will come to the second aspect of the question, in my view, it's why we need specific tools. And first of all, I would say that we have used in the past and so far very much top-down tools where the authorities uh, have more or less decided what needs to be done. We need to complement that, and I'm uh, insisting it's to complement that with a more bottom-up approach where people would just uh, would like control to contribute voluntarily on this nature restoration management and goal. Then the second reason why we need tools, such tools is that uh, we need to build partnerships, to build trust between people who have not always talked to, to, together. I mean, NGOs, private landowners, authorities, these are three worlds and the public is the fourth one. But by, by working together with all those people, you can achieve very powerful um, solutions. So this is really key and this is based on trust. A third reason is that often you would have a piece of land and the nature is not maybe not at the top, but still the quality of nature is improving. So you need to reward effort to incentivize, to get hope to the people who work and recognize efforts. So you need to reward efforts. And then fourth reason to have such tools is that we see and we feel that there is a demand from uh, the, the landowners to, to be more involved, to do more, also in relation with business opportunities, as we have said, uh, we have seen in Denmark. So we need to respond to that demand and offer the right tools and also to reassure the landowners that they can um, commit themselves uh, in terms of nature conservation. So that's all for the moment. And uh, I thank you for the question. Okay, thank you, Joseph. And as you said, we should complement um, top-down approach to bottom-up. Let's go to the bottom there. Uh, talking to Sue um, Stoughton. Uh, sorry, and Sophie. I'm sorry, I'm mis my mistake. And Sophie, as a private landowner from the bottom here and a land manager, could you tell us why private land conservation is important to you from your point of view? Thank you, and Sophie. I think um, the landowners, uh, uh, at least for, for the bigger estates, they have um, uh, owned the land for generations. So um, they, they will offer a very large uh, voluntarily um, effort to, to conserve uh, what they understand as important. Um, and I think that's, uh, they, that's very important that we allow space for that, that, that what's not actually just in fashion right now. I, I'm, I don't know the right word for this, but what are people talking about right now are certain species or certain things, but there's a lot of conservation where people are interested in other species and they do a large um, uh, important work for that. And, and there should be room for that because that might be important in five or 10 years or in 50 years. And, and I think that's, that's the commitment you get from the private owners if they feel responsible for their land then they will take care of it in, in a good way. But as I also said before, they need to be educated as well. If there is, if society demands a certain, if society knows that there are certain areas that need to be better protected or to be, um, go back to a natural way that it was before or something, then you need to have the compensations. Uh, but, but I think you can do a lot by just um, having the, the private owner engaged. They are naturally engaged. In, in the work there, so. Um, and Sophie, I think your mic is off. Okay, can you hear me again? I just, yes, had, a, I just had a barking dog, that's why yes. I muted it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but I think that was, um, uh, and I think it's much more cost effective that you have the private landowners. And I think you have the, we talk about diversity. And I think you have a lot of diversity with with, we see in Denmark, the state run forests have a five year strategy and they change, it, they change every five years. So there's not the continuity of things. Whereas the private landowners, there might be one who's very interested in the birds or one who's very interested in the fish and they will go to a large extent to, to protect that. And I think you, you need to make good incentives for also these uh, uh, 
part because I think it's that will give the large uh, number of protected areas. Okay, thank you, Anne Sophie, for telling us this from uh, from the perspective of a landowner. Uh, we go now to our next question. Um, the use of easements, uh, Tillman, as an NGO representative, um, do you have an idea why the use of these easements is so popular in the US and why they are hardly available in the EU? Thank you for your point of view. Thank you, Valerie, for that question. Well, um, I believe um, there's one important um, reason for that and Joseph kind of pointed it out, out already that some of the functions that conservation easements have in the United States are covered by other tools traditionally in most uh, EU member states, namely land use planning and the de designation of protected areas by public agencies. And uh, something um, that needs explanation, I suppose, is uh, that public authorities are far more powerful in the sector of nature conservation in the EU as compared to the uh, United States, um, at least in, in most uh, states of the United States. So, for example, the designation of private property as a publicly protected area, um, national park or uh, other uh, kind of a nature reserve, um, is very difficult, if not impossible, in the United States. So the private property rights are uh, far more important um, in the United States and the collaboration of private landowners for that reason is also more important. The second reason is the lack of incentives. Uh, Phil has already pointed out the importance of tax incentives for conservation easements. Um, if you look at the historic development of conservation easements in the United States, it was only after the income tax deductions became possible for private landowners donating easements after I believe 19, uh, 1980 that conservation easements became the most important conservation tool in the United States. Um, now, why do I think conservation easements have potential in Europe nevertheless? Um, firstly, because as Joseph said, we need more bottom-up approaches if we want to be successful in, the, uh, in our biodiversity policy objectives. And secondly, I believe there is a niche for conservation easements. We have huge potential um, of private landowners willing to engage in long-term conservation. And Sophie pointed out the intergenerational perspective of private ownership. Um, we do not have these long-term um, goal um, tools right now. The common agriculture policy is oriented on a five-year uh, time span, far too short for most private landowners to engage in long-term conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Tillman. Now, as we go into the third question, uh, I will have to ask uh, the, um, the person who's going to answer to be very short because we're running uh, short on schedule. So the third question, what is a preferred incentive for private landowners to engage in land conservation? This in the EU, the US or worldwide. Uh, and Sophie, firstly, as a landowner and very shortly, what do you think is the preferred incentive for private landowners? I think the private property right is very, very important. It's the feeling that you have the responsibility that gives a lot of energy to the whole system. So I think that's the most important. We have been through a lot of them, so I won't go through uh, the things again because we're short on time. But I think we all need to look into the barriers, uh, the risk for the landowner to enter in this, that we have to remove these things. For, 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 for more landowners to be engaged. I think that's very important, keeping it short. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Then over to the other side of the world. Uh, from an US policy advisor point of view, Phil, can you give us your opinion on the matter? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, and uh, I will draw on the, the work that the uh, ELO and the Nature Conservancy have done to sur do survey research to harvest the opinions of private landowners about what they want to see in terms of uh, incentives, and they fall into two categories. One is the tax incentives that are available to help uh, the, the management of land uh, for conservation purposes to, uh, for landowners, and the other thing that uh, landowners have spoken about in, the, in our survey research has been uh, cash payments in the form of cost sharing or other financial uh, payments directly to landowners to help them 
uh, undertake land management for uh, conservation purposes. So those are the two buckets that I would say are the most important incentives for uh, helping private landowners. Can I Thank add you. one? Can I, can I add one Thank little you. thing? Yeah, I, the, I think that with that it's only uh, covering the costs quite often, and it's difficult for people to take out their land and only have the covered the cost. What what should they live up then? So you also need to sometimes have proper incentives. That's that's was just an, one more important thing. Okay, thank you for enlightening this to us, uh, Phil and Anne-Sophie from US and Europe. Then if we gather everything together we've heard today and we've heard in the discussions, one of uh, the key questions to ask is what should be do done to increase private land conservation activities in Europe? Uh, let's start with Sue. Sue, as a key actor from the sector, can you tell us what should be done to increase private land conservation activities activities in Europe, in your opinion? Thank you. I have a minute instead of several hours. Um, I think the, the key questions, the key messages here are conservation, community um, and commitment. We need the community to commit to conservation in the long term. We've already heard that most of the land in Europe is, is privately uh, owned anyway. So, to do that, I think we really need to focus on effectiveness, on monitoring, assessment, research and education. And if we understand how we can be effective in conservation on private lands, then we can celebrate the role of private landowners um, and encourage more private, land, private landowners to go towards that um, uh, conservation commitment. Um, and I think, um, finally, as I said before, we really need to deal with the perverse incentives. Um, we need to ensure that conservation is the norm for private land holdings in Europe, not a few minority um, people who have really understood the importance of conservation. Thank you, Sue. Now, Jürgen, we would like to ask the same question to you, please. Yes, I, I will make it very short with a number of, 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 of keywords. Uh, first of all, what I see is voluntary tools, um, much more in favor uh, with private landowners than what they're obliged to do so. So, so vol the voluntary is very important. I think uh, we absolutely need a large, many, a large menu of instruments so that different private landowners who have all have a different level of engagement can also do something with that engagement at different levels. And for that, you need different tools. Extremely important for private landowners is recognition. Getting recognition for the work they do is an enormous motivation uh, for private landowners. And then what we need is, well, let's say a stable economy, a stable financial situation and a stable policy so that people who are starting in a certain process are absolutely sure that within five, within 10 years, they still have, uh, let's say, the same way of reasoning, the same way of thinking, so that they do not have to restart their project every two years. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. That sounded very clear. Uh, I'm sorry for rushing you a bit there, but uh, the participants and uh, the listeners have been very active, so we've received lots of lots of questions and I would like to start uh, the questions and answers now. Is that uh, correct, Marie? Yes. Okay, so let's start with the first question, uh, which would be directed to Phil. Uh, the question is as follows. Are there any examples of the use of conservation easements, easement type agreements, sorry, that include affordable access for agrarian users? Phil. Yes, uh, uh, in the United States, there are two categories of programs that are available to encourage uh, farmland protection and uh, uh, farmers to be able to stay on the property. The one category involves the purchase of what are called development rights, which is in, the, in the, another form of a conservation easement. And the, the, there are public programs that purchase development rights 
providing capital to far, to landowners or farmers, and thus enabling that land to be uh, limited in its value so that it can be used economically for farming. And it provi obviously provides capital to the farmer to help the farmer's uh, financial viability. The second category of, of programs has to do with public programs that are that provide financing to first time farmers or new farmers. And as part of those programs, uh, a condition of receiving those grants involves protection of the land that is being used for farming through a conservation easement. So there, there are many programs like that throughout the United States. Okay, thank you for answering that, uh, Phil. Um, I wonder, Tillman, uh, would you like to uh, give another opinion on that question? Are there any examples of the use of conservation easement type agreements? that include affordable access for agrarian users? Um, well, speaking for the European Union, um, certainly there are uh, conservation easements on uh, private property that is under uh, agrarian use or other type of land uses. Um, however, there's an important difference to the United States as public access is in many countries, at least in the European Union, as uh, granted as an everyman's right uh, to a certain degree. Uh, Anne Sophie will know more about this in Denmark. This is hot uh, potato. Um, so this is something that uh, similarly to um, land use planning and so forth is already governed through other tools and does not need uh, additional um, uh, specification under uh, with, within the framework of conservation easement. Thank you, Tillman. And I have a second question straight away for you. Actually, uh, maybe not a bad question. Uh, someone asks, are NGOs like Naturpunt, which is uh, kind of like the, the Flemish Belgium Nature Conservancy organization, are they considered as a private landowner and land conservation actor? Well, they certainly can be considered a private landowner as they're a non-public entity. Um, and as a matter of fact, land purchase is one important private land conservation tool, both in the United States and in Europe. And it has been in use for, by conservation organizations and individuals uh, for a long time. However, um, having said that, I would say the um, focus of our network is less on those traditional tools such as land purchase and rather on uh, innovative tools that are more collaborative and that leave the ownership of uh, the land in the hands of private individuals uh, in the stricter sense. Thank you. Then we shall continue with a third question for Jürgen, Jürgen Tuck. Um, this is a question from uh, Silvia Scozzafava from Italy. I hope I pronounced that quite uh, okay. Um, she's a founder of a startup, uh, founded in 2020, so very recently. Um, the mission of the startup is to foster finance for biodiversity, promoting all existing tools, especially those targeting private initiative. And in her experience, there is a lot of skepticism about the possibility to couple business and nature, both in businessmen and in conservation people. Most people focus apparently on simple tools of bringing economic benefits to landowners, like green tourism or organic agri-food supply change, chains, sorry. Uh, but there is little awareness on the ecosystem services possibilities, um, PS and more complex mechanism that couple ecosystem, uh, what is G, ESG, anyone? ESG investments and biodiversity conservation. Um, Jürgen, can you give her some kind of idea of how you feel about that? Yes, I can. But in the meantime, I have an able to start video uh, because the host didn't allow me to. That's better so. <laughs> okay, no, um, <laughs> scepticism. Oh yes, um, I, I'm sure that 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 many of of, of individual private landowners, but also of companies uh, who are trying to be active in nature conservation, sometimes have that scepticism from the outside world. It's not the traditional partner uh, to do nature conservation with, but what we see is that more recently, more and more companies are getting involved, 
private individuals are getting involved. Uh, and so that makes that uh, if now that we see the first success cases, that let's say you get a growing group of believers that indeed uh, companies and private individuals uh, can, make, uh, can make a difference. Um, does that mean that it's easy for them? No, it isn't uh, quite often because let's say the ideal instruments are not always available. But I think that, well, let's say with the Lented Forever project, but uh, uh, our colleagues from um, the project, uh, which is led by Tillman, uh, that exactly we are trying to promote and to create the number of instruments uh, that can be used throughout Europe exactly to promote uh, the participation of uh, private landowners, of private organizations, of private companies. And I think uh, if you are capable of showing some su very successful cases, that the scepticism will, will very short, uh, in a very short time uh, will, will disappear. I thank you, Jürgen, uh, for answering this question. I hope um, it was uh, sufficient. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it's, it's related to the same one. Um, let's see, maybe Sue, if you can start uh, to give your uh, answer to this one. What should be done to increase private land conservation activities in Europe? And after Sue, we'll see who else can or wants to answer this. So what should be done to increase private land conservation activities in Europe? Thank you, Sue. So I think that was fairly similar to what we were just um, talking about in the open questions. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot of the different incentives that, that could be made available. Um, I'll say again that I think we need to, to, to get rid of the disincentives. Um, I think we need more research on what actually is a measure of success. And I saw that a later question was about bonds, which I think is quite an, an, an interesting one on green bonds, because again, you know, we really need measures of success for uh, incentive systems like that to work. Um, and although we have a lot of experience of private land conservation in Europe, I think we're still not totally um, being as successful as we could do to reverse the biodiversity crisis. And a lot of that will come down to education and research. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, I have the idea you want to comment on that. Yeah, just, I mean, uh, I think that trying to make people not used to work together, to work together, like, I mean, conservation NGOs and private landowners authorities, as, as I said, is, can be very powerful. And I mean, uh, yes, and reward the people for what they, they do. I mean, that could be very useful. And maybe on the question on uh, ecosystem services, I think the, the water companies and uh, are key players. Thank you. Okay, uh, Philip, you wanted to comment on that furthermore? I, I would just say in, in terms of the reference to uh, green bonds, there are a number of examples in the United States of uh, what I would call creative financing to uh, provide capital to uh, conservation private landowners and conservation organizations to accomplish conservation. Uh, there's a growing body of experience with impact investing in which we're trying to use the benefits of the private marketplace to support uh, capital uh, conservation for uh, both uh, capital return as well as conservation outcomes. So uh, there are a number of examples that are uh, interesting to look at from that perspective. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joseph, your mic is still off. Uh, did you still want to comment on that or no? Okay, well then I thank you and I've seen our time is up for today. So I would like to thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you amongst us. Um, our program contains four webinars all available in replay on Lantis Forever, in the Lantis Forever website. Um, and within the scope of this project, a US study tool was arranged um, to increase the understanding and commitment of successful private and conservation initiatives in the US and to compare them with the situation in Europe. 
Um, this US study tour of this program will be rescheduled to 2021. We shall be communicating about this as soon as it will be possible due to COVID activities, uh, when it is possible to plan and travel safely. It was a great pleasure to have those four webinars and discuss the private land conservation tools with all of you. Wishing you all a good evening in Europe or a good day uh, in the US. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye, thank you.